All right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I know it's early, but we'll, we'll get started. We've got a really exciting GAC for you today. So you can call them GACs, you can call them GACs, which is a very unpleasant way of saying it. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do today um, is start with a very brief introduction of just what are we doing today? What is a GAC? Um, if you've never been to one of these before, so you know what to expect. Uh, and then we'll go right into the actual program. Um, so today's GAC is uh, one of two. The other one is behind you in the other room. So uh, you can check your, your self program and make sure you're in the right place. Um, and so this one is going to be on reconciling the dichotomy between Sherringtonian and Hopfieldian network views on neural computations. Um, but first, what is a GAC? What is a generative adversarial collaboration? So uh, the goal of a GAC is not to have uh, a single presentation with a single viewpoint uh, that then propagates through the community, but instead to have uh, a number of scientists who get together who may have actually fundamentally opposing views. And the goal is in that collaboration, which is also adversarial due to the, uh, the opposing view component of it, for them to come together and align their vocabularies uh, and to align their perspectives so that they may not agree on the, me the measure or the topic at hand, but they might agree on how to make progress in resolving or reconciling their differences moving forward. Maybe there's a series of experiments that might be critical to resolving these views. Maybe there's a shared vocabulary or shared taxonomy that needs to be developed so that people can stop talking past each other. And so we started this project back in uh, 2020 uh, during the pandemic, and it's really grown into this really exciting, um, this, this exciting uh, protocol. So uh, the idea here is that science does benefit from alternative ideas and theories. We don't want to just have a single track mind. Um, but too often what we're doing is we're trying to prove our own theories correct instead of trying to falsify ourselves or trying to come to a compromise with those who might disagree. And so um, we're going to bring together researchers with these alternative theories to collaborate, to resolve or at least align their differences, um, and to together design the best way possible forward, um, because healthy and friendly and collaborative competition can accelerate our scientific progress. So we're really happy to be doing uh, now, I believe, the fourth iteration of the GACs um, this year. So the benefits for the CCN community, though, are that you can actually get involved in this process, too. So this is a bi-directional conversation. Um, the GACs are designed to be open and public for uh, participation from all of you in the audience, not only here today, but actually beforehand and afterwards as well. So this is a fantastic learning opportunity, especially for younger scientists in the room. So we really encourage you, stand up, grab that microphone, ask questions, and get involved. Um, it allows us to have community engagement throughout not only CCN, we hope this will engender conversations, but before and afterwards, uh, so we get that diversity of perspectives contributing to the process. Um, and then this also allows us to elevate what we think as a community are some of the most important challenges and controversies in the field right now. What are the things that we really need to be talking about, the big questions in the room? Um, and then the idea here is that this is also fully transparent. So GACs are community driven in the sense that uh, you can put together a group of your own accord and you can propose a GAC uh, for every CCN um, in the future. Uh, and then um, the idea is that after today's kickoff workshop, others can continue to get involved. So if you find that today's GAC really speaks to you, check, at, uh, check in with the organizers afterwards and see if you can get involved somehow. Uh, and then there will hopefully be a position piece written later uh, to, to kind of uh, crystallize and push forward what was talked about today. So we've actually had 13 GACs so far in the past three years. So this is year four as an iteration. A lot of these actually, because they happened during the pandemic, were recorded and live streamed. So if you'd like today's event, you can actually check out the previous ones from previous years. I can actually see some folks in the room who have participated in previous GACs. And so um, maybe, uh, maybe I don't want to call too many people out, but if you are one of those people, maybe raise your hand. There's a couple people in the room. Yeah, look at that. So there's actually some people who have participated here. Um, and just to give you an idea, there are folks in the room who've been through this process before. 
You can find all the previous proposals and discussions at the GAC website, gac.ccneuro.org, and you can also participate in live or in uh, asynchronous communication about the GACs there, a conversation in a forum style. Um, and I, I recognize that this isn't at the top of everyone's like daily checklist when you go and check all your news feeds, is that GAC is not the one that you check at the beginning. Um, so there's not been a whole lot of lively conversation there, but I wanted to give a special thank you to this one person who has, who has participated in the online conversation. And I really encourage you all to go and, and check this out and, and participate as well in the forum. Okay, um, and we have five preprints and papers that all have all, um, they're coming out in the journal Neurons, Behavior, Data Analysis, and Theory. Okay, uh, there are the five papers that you can see. Uh, they're very beautiful looking and they, they have some really lovely discussion that aligns vocabulary, taxonomy, and um, ideology or at least fleshes out the differences and the, the points and sources of controversy more fully. So GACs are pretty great. We're very happy uh, to have this here at CCN, uh, now for the fourth iteration. And so that's where I'm gonna stop. Here's GAC1, and I'm going to let the organizers of the GACs completely take over and run the next few hours for you. So thanks for being here and being part of this process, guys. Uh, yeah, so thanks everyone for coming. Uh, thanks for getting out so early. And thanks especially to the uh, CCN organizers for making the conference in this GAC possible. Um, so the story of this collaboration really started for me after I presented some results in lab meeting. I was working on network models of spatial representation and I was comparing two different network architectures that both learned to predict what an agent was gonna see. And what I was finding was that I had two networks, both of which develop spatially tuned cells, right? So these show the spatial tuning of various cells in the networks. But when I looked at the, the neural manifold of these cell, of the networks, I found that they ended up with dramatically different population manifolds. Um, and so the interesting thing I was finding was that as a result of the different population manifolds, you ended up with a different emergent computational ability, namely one network could produce replay offline while the other one couldn't. And so this was a property that we really weren't able to tell from the networks by looking at their single cell properties, but we then were able to tell by looking at this kind of neural manifold perspective. And so after I presented this result the first time in lab, uh, Johnny and Don Yen said to me, well, this sounds a lot like this paper we've discussing and actually considering uh, submitting a, a GAC to CCN form. And so that paper is this one from David Barrick and John Krakauer, uh, two views on the cognitive brain in which they, they lay out these kind of two kind of canonical views that are, that are present in the literature right now. One is what they called the Sherringtonian view um, which David will tell you lots more about soon, but it seeks to explain cognition in terms of operations of signals performed on nodes in a network and implemented by specific neurons in their connections and circuits. And the second, or Hopfieldian view, explains cognition as a result of transformations between representational spaces which are implemented by neural populations and manifolds. And so as a lab whose primary methodology is to build neural networks, there was kind of this ongoing debate in the lab, uh, one about how we should really take and understand this paper for our work um, and the relationship between the two views, but especially where do neural networks based approaches kind of fit in this distinction, right? We're, we're really using models that are explicitly made up of nodes and connections and the computations that they, they perform emerge from the interactions of these nodes and connections, but we really often study their representational spaces and use manifold-based approaches to, to understand how those computations are done. And so the thinking was, well, maybe these approaches with neural networks might be a way to kind of reconcile the two different views. And so that's one of the things we're hoping to discuss today. Um, here's the beginning of the schedule. Uh, we are here. <laughs> Um, and I'll get off the stage soon, and then we're gonna have David kind of present the outline of the views, um, and I would assume make a, uh, 
a case for the Hopfieldian view, because he would say he's a diehard Hopfieldian. And then we're going to have John Krakauer uh, follow that up and really kind of go into what, what do we mean by a first level explainer and what should the first level explainer of cognition be. Uh, we're then going to have a short period in which we hope the audience will ask questions of David and John to kind of clarify what they mean by these different views. And then we're going to have two more talks, one from Tatiana Engel presenting um, this recent review that, uh, that she had um, in which she presents uh, uh, recent work showing really how in some, uh, some uh, really representative examples we have the emergence of spatial manifolds from cognition. So really trying to use this circuits-based perspective as a way to connect what seems a lot like a Sherringtonian view, something about cells and connections, to a Hopfieldian view, something about manifolds. Um, and so circuits and this view of, of the circuit may be a, a, a tentative unifying view or principle for these two things. And then we're going to have a talk from James Whittington, and he's going to present uh, this recent work, which we had also been discussing in the lab, on uh, how individual functional cell types can emerge from neural networks. So you can end up with something that looks like a Sherringtonian view just from the emergent properties of, of collective networks. Um, and then we're going to have a panel in which uh, everyone gets up and we're going to clarify the terms a little bit more. There will be opportunity for more questions, and I have some questions for the, the speakers. Um, unfortunately, we do have a few slight changes. One is that John uh, came down with COVID, so he's going to have to tune in remotely. Uh, he wasn't able to make it. And the other is that something else came up for James, and he's, his talk is going to have to be recorded. But fortunately, we're going to have replacements on their panels. So John is going to fill in for John, because that seems to be a good replacement. And we have uh, Shahab Bakhtiari filling in for James, who also works on neural networks and their emergent properties in the visual system. And then for session two, we're going to have Johnny Cornford uh, really kind of asking this question of where does learning fit in um, and presenting some results in which you have synaptic geometry, which seems to be a very Sherringtonian process or uh, feature, and it has a strong dependent on the computational solutions found by networks. And then Don Yen is going to talk about a situation in which uh, you also have networks in which you have cells with really nice tuning curves, but it turns out they aren't even doing the computation that they thought they were just based on the tuning curves. Right? So these all seem to be different perspectives on should we be looking at single cells and connections or should we be looking at neural manifolds? And then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for a, a discussion with everyone in the audience. And so I'm about to get off the stage, but just to kind of see where we're at in terms of uh, uh, where people think they are in the beginning. So I ran this very scientific poll on both Twitter and Mastodon because, you know, the social media world is falling apart right now. Uh, but it does seem like at least, you know, from this somewhat representative sample, uh, the vast majority of people, or the plurality of people, seem to identify with this Hopfieldian kind of view. But I will note that uh, about 20% of people say they align with neither, and about 30% of people don't get the difference. So I think one of our biggest goals from this, this uh, GAC, or GAC, is to really uh, address uh, this majority of people and to say, one, here's the difference that uh, these two views mean, and if you're neither, what might the other options be? And so now I'm going to get off the stage and I'm going to hand things off to David.
Thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Dongyan, for helping organize everything, for all the organizers for putting this together. Um, thank you uh, to the organizers of the conference uh, for selecting our uh, Generative Adversarial Collaboration, our GAC. Thank you to my co-symposius adversaries, allies. It's a little unclear. Hopefully, that will be resolved by the end of today. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and to discuss how neural activity might explain cognition. A little more than two years ago, John Krakauer and I published a paper outlining two views on how the brain might explain cognition, the Sherringtonian and Hopfieldian views. These two views were inspired by distinct themes in work on cognition in the neurosciences. Today, I will outline these two views, discuss some of their similarities and differences, and briefly argue in support of the Hopfieldian approach. To get started, what is cognition? Cognition is the transformation of representations to produce intelligent behavior. By representation, I mean states of the system that are about things in the world. These representations are typically more sophisticated than traditionally supposed in neuroscience. They do not merely carry information about the world that helps guide behavior, a common definition in neuroscience, though they certainly do do that. There are a range of other properties that they have, and I don't have time to go into them deeply, but for example, they can be stimulus independent. By computation, I mean ways of using representations that can be described as operations on or transformations of those representations. For example, transforming a representation of a goal, such as taking a vacation, into representations that can help plan the trip, like buying an airplane ticket. This general framework helps situate our debate. It's important to keep this framework in mind. When discussing the neural basis of cognition, we need to describe the representations, we need to describe the computations over those representations and how those computations give rise to behavior. The notion of a level permeates discussions of cognition. But what is a level and how to think of these levels? There are two relevant senses of level for this discussion. First, I distinguish different levels of explanation, first level, second level, and so on. I'm interested in the first level explainers of cognition, which will make some neural facts more relevant than others to such explanations. Take, for example, the case of a broken window. Why did the window break? The window's breaking here is the explanatory target. The first level explainer of the window's breaking is that the ball hit the window. But the ball hitting the window to break it can itself be the target of explanation. There are, in fact, two explanations of the balls hitting the window to break it. The first, the velocity and momentum of the ball explain why the window broke. And secondly, the window broke because it was brittle. These two facts help explain the balls hitting the window to break it. But each of these facts can themselves receive explanation. The ball's velocity and momentum are explained by how the ball is thrown and the brittleness of the glass is explained by the molecular structure of the glass. Each element of an explanation can receive a further explanation itself. But in virtue of the series of explanatory relations, these further explanations are lower level explainers of the main target, which in this case is the windows breaking. That is explained in the first instance by the ball hitting it. So there is this structure to explanation, and my concern is with the first stop in that structure, the first level explainers of cognition. In addition to levels of explanation, there are levels of analysis. Now, I adopt Mars' analytical framework for levels of analysis with some minor changes such as to the labels. At the ecological level, the problem facing the organism and how they might solve it is described. At the computational or algorithmic level, the system's representations, the operations over those representations that the system can perform the computations, and the computing architecture of the system are described. And finally, at the implementational level, the physical system that implements the computations and algorithms are described. The Sherringtonian and Hopfieldian views on the relationship between cognition and the brain largely agree on the ecological level, but differ on the computational algorithmic and the implementational level. They also agree on numerous aspects of the scientific enterprise to explain the nature of cognition. They agree on the phenomena that demand explanations, such as attention, memory, decision-making, and so forth. 
This list needs revision, it needs formal characterization for certain, but the two views don't disagree on the set of targets. So this is key. The explanatory target here are the cognitive phenomena. So when we're talking about first level explainers, we're talking about first level explainers of cognition. They also agree on the concepts that can be used to construct these explanations, most obviously neuroanatomical concepts like neuron, cell, neurotransmitter, action potential, and so forth, but also more information processing concepts like signal or circuit, as well as mathematically inspired ones like networks, state spaces, or manifolds. So given these similarities, how do the two views differ? They differ on the first level explainers for cognition at both the algorithmic computational and the implementational level. The Sherringtonian view is committed to explaining cognition as a transformation of signals by nodes in a point-to-point -point architecture. These nodes and connections are, uh, correspond to neurons embedded in circuits and pathways in the brain. At the algorithmic computational level, the Sherringtonian view uh, explains cognition as the result of specific patterns of node-to-node -node connections where individual nodes transform representations. So the signals between the nodes are the representations, and those transform functions are uh, the computations. At the implementational level, the Sherringtonian describes neurons, circuits, intra and extracellular pathways, and other sorts of biophysiological properties that implement the circuits at the algorithmic or computational level. As an example of a Sherringtonian explanation, consider uh, the case of the random dot motion task, the explanation of perceptual decision making in noisy task conditions. To explain this capacity, neuroscientists use the task displayed on the screen, this random dot motion task. In one common version of the task, monkeys first fixate and then maintain their gaze as two targets appear, followed by a centrally presented field of randomly moving dots, some fraction of which are moving left and some fraction of which are moving right. Monkeys then indicate their decision about the direction of motion with an eye movement to a target in the corresponding direction. The explanation of the capacity is framed in Sherringtonian terms. A representation of the motion evidence, the evidence about the direction in which the dots are moving, is carried by neurons in area MT. At stage one, these neurons take in visual information and output a signal or representation of the speed and direction of motion. At stage two, this signal is sent along dedicated pathways to neurons in area LIP. Neurons in area LIP integrate the motion evidence from area MT to form a representation of the sum of the evidence. At stage three, this representation thresholds signaling downstream action selection and initiation. A dedicated series of nodes and pathways with particular neural transfer functions transforms the motion input into the response. In contrast to the Sherringtonian view, the Hopfieldian view is committed to representational spaces with computation described as the transformations between or movement within those spaces. Networks of neurons and mass measures of neural activity implement these spaces and transformations. At the algorithmic computational level, the Hopfieldian describes representational spaces and the way that cognitive systems move through them or transform them. So the location of the system in the space is the representation, and the movement within or between spaces are the computations, those transformations over the representations. At the implementational level, these representational spaces and transformations are implemented in neural spaces assessed using mass measures of neural activity, such as population recordings from many neurons. Here's an example of a Hopfieldian explanation of temporal interval estimation. To study temporal interval estimation, monkeys had to estimate the duration of an interval of time. They first waited through an interval uh, indicated by this ready point, labeled the estimation epoch, and then they had to delay responding for a period of time here labeled the production epoch um, until they thought that they had waited for an interval that matched the one they had just experienced. At that time, they had to make a response. That's this go right here. Their goal was to recreate the interval experience during the estimation epoch. The temporal intervals experienced during the estimation epoch were represented using trajectories in neural space. Neural activity traveled along a manifold in a low-dimensional representational space embedded in a high-dimensional neural one. 
This space was revealed by dimensionality analysis of population recordings from the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex during the estimation epoch. This is when the monkey is experiencing the interval that they will later have to recreate. Different sets of possible intervals, short here in red, long here in blue, are represented by these distinct manifolds. Each point on the trajectory is a representation of the state of the system at a time. At the start of the interval, labeled here ready, neural activity begins to traverse the space along one of the two manifolds, depending on the distribution. With the end point correlating with the length of the interval, so this 800 point here is 800 milliseconds, uh, uh, the interval that they experienced. This explanation appeals only to the structure of the trajectories through the state space that make up the manifolds and leaves out details about specific neurons and connections. This representation is transformed to set the speed of neural activity as it transits through the neural state space during the subsequent production epoch. On the right here is a depiction of neural activity during that production epoch when the animal reports its estimate by waiting the right amount of time before responding. During this epoch, neural activity in the same area as during the estimation epoch was observed to travel through a 3D manifold space along separate trajectories and different speeds for each of the intervals I had to recreate. So the colors map onto the intervals over here. The explanation of the amount of time required for the neural activity to traverse this space relies on a vector projection computation. The vector from the shortest time to the estimated time here is projected onto the vector from the shortest time to the longest time. That's indicated by this arrow here. This projection computation sets the speed with which neural activity moves along these manifolds here on the right during the production epoch. For shorter intervals, the speed is higher. For longer intervals, the speed is slower. I don't have time to go into the sort of fine details here, but I direct people toward the beautiful study from Sohn et al. from 2019. In this explanation, then, the representation and the computation occur in the low-dimension manifold space. In short, neural spaces contain dynamical structure in the form of trajectories through them that can help explain cognition and that cannot be captured by the Sherringtonian view. We can directly compare and contrast the two views. The comparison reveals the relations between them and allows me to address some initial objections. First, at the algorithmic computational level, the Sherringtonian proposes that the abstract description of computation for cognition will consist only of nodes and connections between them, with signals passed along the connections to be transformed at the nodes. In contrast, the Hopfieldian view emphasizes representational spaces. These are abstract spaces whose dimensions describe dimensions of variation in some subject matter, such as faces or temporal intervals in the example I just presented. The computational objects that you care about on the Hopfieldian view include the space, but also the dynamics of the system, such as the structure of the trajectories through the space. For the Sherringtonian, only single cells can carry representational content as first level explainer. In contrast, the representational power of the Hopfieldian view asserts that representational spaces are first level explainers. An objection is that the Hopfieldian view is merely an abstraction of the Sherringtonian one. But in reply, the Sherringtonian view does not imply a Hopfieldian one. Each node in a Sherringtonian explanation can be conceptualized as a dimension of a system. As such, these explanations do imply a Hopfieldian representation with the value of a node, say the level of activation of some neuron, defining the location of the system along that dimension in the system state space. Note, though, that the representational vehicle has shifted from the nodes to the overall location in the space of activity. However, while the representation can be described as a Hopfieldian one, the computation cannot. On the Sherringtonian view, the computations are transformations at the nodes, whereas on the Hopfieldian view, the transformations are described at the levels of the spaces, like the vector projection computation I described for temporal interval estimation. So as a result, while Sherringtonian representations may imply Hopfieldian ones, Sherringtonian computations do not imply Hopfieldian ones. At the implementational level, there are stark differences. The Sherringtonian focuses on types of neurons, the specific pathways between them, and other neuroanatomical details. In contrast, the Hopfieldian focuses on emergent neural objects that I call neural spaces 
that are implemented by the spiking activity of many neurons are possibly other biophysiological properties of the brain. I should add that there, there's no need to adopt a radical Hopfieldian view where the whole brain is treated simultaneously. You can apply this sort of way of explaining cognition by considering parts of the brain as Hopfieldian systems. Okay, I wanna, I'm gonna skip some stuff because I, I wanna keep things moving. This way of understanding cognition makes some fundamental assumptions. In particular, for some cognitive phenomenon, there's some level of description that is best for explaining that phenomenon. So there need not be um, exclusively one, but it can't be all the levels. Not all the details are relevant. Some details are more important than others for our explanations. But how to determine which details are privileged at first level explainers? I'll discuss two ways. First, uh, they are loci of generalizability or regularity. Uh, this generalizability provides grounds for inferring the presence of some law-like regularity that describes how the cognitive phenomenon comes about and that applies in all or most cases of that cognitive phenomenon. And second, there are details about the control of the system. These are the knobs that can be turned that allow the system to intervene and causally manipulate its own behavior. There are then two arguments that can be inspired by these ways of identifying first-level explainers, the argument from regularity and from control. So very briefly, the argument from regularity says that first-level explanations describe regularities in neurocognitive systems. Hopfieldian explanations describe regularities in those systems. Therefore, Hopfieldian explanations are first-level explanations. So the idea here is that Hopfieldian explanations are to be preferred because they're the locus of generalizability across cognitive systems. And the argument from control is a little more convoluted. It says that first-level explanations describe the level which systems are controlled. Low-dimensional systems are more controllable than high-D ones. Hopfieldian explanations often describe systems as low-D. Therefore, Hopfieldian explanations are first-level explanations. The idea here is that fewer knobs presents a more manageable control problem than having many knobs. If every neuron or every neural coalition presented a knob that the system had to twiddle to control its cognitive behavior, then the, then the controller faces a very complex control problem. This might do for some hardwired systems, but becomes unmanageable. So from the system's perspective, control is easier when there are fewer dimensions, as often occur in the case of Hopfieldian explanations. So these were just two arguments uh, for the Hopfieldian approach. Here's a rough schematic of explanations for cognitive phenomena on that approach as I envision it. The cognitive phenomenon to be explained is at the top. The first level is a collection of Hopfieldian systems that together perform computations on representations to give rise to cognitive behavior. And these in turn are explained at the second level by other systems which might be Sherringtonian, but instead might be Hopfieldian. So in sum, the Hopfieldian view is preferred over the Sherringtonian view for neuroscientific explanations of cognition because those explanations are the first level explanations of cognition. Okay, thank you very much for uh, listening to me. What's the next step? Who's up now? John? So I should end my show and then... Should I, should I stay? I'm muted. Great. Okay. And I'm done. And my, can you hear me, David? Yes. So am I, should I share my screen or is it visible? Because I can't see the screen. So should I start? I, I just don't know what to do. <laughs> so we can so we see, can see um, your, your deck. deck. We're not seeing, if you have presenter view, we don't see. Ah, there we go. Perfect. No, can you see it? Should I start? Yes. Yes. Um, okay, well, I'm really sorry uh, that I can't be there. I've been looking forward to this for months and thank you so much to the organizers and, and really apologize for being so passe as to get COVID in 2023, um, but so be it. Um, I'm just gonna quickly speak uh, a slightly more abstract level even than David, given that he did such an amazing job of uh, summarizing the paper. Um, so let me just jump right into it. Um, this is a cartoon that I really like, where you know there's basically this idea that there are fields that are more pure um, as you reduce 
so sociology is just applied psychology, psychology is just applied biology, so that's the critical one for us here, which is surely psychology slash cognitive science can be reduced to neuroscience because it's just applied biology and then biology is just applied chemistry and on and on we go, right? Um, and obviously there's something wrong with this view. Um, and I think we have to sort of telescope or microscope down onto this and look inside neuroscience itself. Um, this was very famously said by Phil Anderson, the Nobel Prize winning um, solid state physicist who wrote this incredible paper, More is Different, in 1972. And basically, he also talked about, you know, the object of, of, of explanation um, on, in the, on Y and the things they were explaining on X. Very similar to the notion of first versus second level explainers all the way down. And to quote him, that, but this hierarchy does not imply that science X is just applied Y at each stage entirely new laws, concepts, and generalizations are necessary to the point that David made, what is the level of granularity or coarse graining where you can see most of the invariances and make the generalizations? Um, and we're requiring inspiration and creativity just to a greater degree as in the previous one. Psychology is not applied biology, nor is biology applied chemistry. Now, interestingly, these notions that are very well accepted, the notions of emergence, complexity in physics, Neuroscientists have a strange blind spot about it, and they somehow feel that any talk about these concepts, even by Nobel laureates, are somehow spooky and not worth consideration. And, and that is a major mistake, and is one of the reasons why we're having debates like this today. And, you know, the disciplines like this um, have overlapping and separate vocabularies, concepts, and explanatory objects. Um, and the point is, is that these are not epistemological, in my view. They're ontological. In other words, the reason why the disciplines carve out like this is because they, in fact, do require different ontologies. Um, and then here's a statement by John Searle. Unfortunately, he's been somewhat, you know, he's got himself into trouble, but he makes this point, which I agree, is with most types of real entities, from split-level ranch houses to cocktail parties, from interest rates to football games, do not undergo a smooth reduction to the entities of some fundamental theory. Why should they? Right? Um, and, you know, this is the question we should be asking ourselves. So here we have on the left these notion of autonomous levels with their own ontologies, philosophy, sociology, social psychology, psychology, biology, chemistry, physics. And what I would like to argue, and I think what is being said here in our paper, is that there are different ways of thinking about the different aspects of the behaviors along the neuroaxis in a similar way. So we have action potentials, stretch reflexes, CPGs, eye movements, and up to thinking. Now, it would be very strange, given the arguments made in physics and the existence of the different disciplines, to believe that the units of explanation should remain invariant as we go up the neuroaxis. I mean, Sherrington himself, when he started to investigate the stretch reflex, specifically stated that it was unclear whether this would approach would work when you got up into cortex. And one of the strange things about the circuit approach is this belief that the neurons and their connections and their nodes will be the single unit of explanation no matter where you are in the neuroaxis and no matter what you're trying to explain. It would be like saying that we should be allowed to use physics to explain sociology. So here are two quotes. This is from the philosopher Strevens. I'll be using an example from him in a minute. And he makes the point, the high-level sciences neglect the low-level mechanisms for principled reasons and will continue to do so even in their finished form. They need not and indeed should not draw on the lower-level sciences for their explanatory content. Now, again, this point is being made across the disciplines, but I would argue you can make exactly the same claim that the way that you explain the stretch re reflex and eye movements is not going to work when you're trying to explain cognition. The object of explanation is going to have to change. And my brother, and you know, if there's one achievement that I make in this talk is to suggest that you go and listen to a talk he recently gave 
uh, that's available on YouTube where he talked about this notion of emergence. And his definition here is when there is no need to look under the hood. In other words, when do you have screened off autonomous object, objects of explanation that can do the work without having to go down levels? And here's a slide uh, from his talk. And basically the idea here is, is that you have protectorates and functional closure. You have effective levels that work for explanation. So here we have it at the level of AlphaGo, where you have the hardware, you have the software, and then you have strategies of the game of Go itself. And obviously when Lee Sedol was watching AlphaGo beat him, he was appreciative of the strategy that AlphaGo was using at the level of the game. Lee Sedol did not have to think about the hardware of the software that the computer was running, it was, it's irrelevant to an appreciation of the strategies of Go. And this is a general property of complex systems. And if we all agree that the brain is a complex system, then by definition, it means that you have effective levels where you can actually seal off some of the details. That's what a complex system is. If you had to explain the game of Go in terms of transistors going on and off, then you would not be dealing with a complex system. Okay, now what the other definition that he gives about a complex system is where one of the proofs that you have an effective level is that you can actually predict states at t plus one from state t. Now let me give you an example. If you were watching episode one of The White Lotus season two, and you were watching what all the characters were doing, and you went, hmm, I have a prediction that in episodes two and three, that X is gonna sleep with Y, and there's going to be a problem with these characters, that would be the effective theory of the HBO series and the characters. And it would be very strange if you said you would have had a better appreciation of the states of season two from season one by worrying about neurons or brain regions or nodes and connections, okay? So it's extremely important to understand that explanation in science in physics and onwards deals with effective theories and levels which are quite autonomous in their explanatory potential of predicting future states from current states. Again, my brother gives a very nice talk about this uh, and you can see it on YouTube. And here are some examples of these functionally closed protectorates. For example, the idea of gas laws. You know, you can absolutely talk about the behavior of the system at the level of the state variables, volume, absolute pressure, absolute temperature. These are protected by statistical mechanics and other such phenomena. Again, it would be unne it is unnecessary to go below the level of over a large range where there's robustness in the system below the state variables of volume, pressure, and temperature. Similarly, at the level of kind of psychology, there's Zipf's law, which tells you something about the frequency of a word in text um, based on its rank. And basically, you can say the frequency in the word is inversely proportional to its rank. So, for example, the, the word the ap appears, let's say, in 20% of the words in a text, then the word of, and then the word, um, I don't know what the next one is, uh, of, yeah, uh, of and the uh, appear at one over the n of their position. So, in other words, you've got this law operating at the level of the rank and frequency of words in text. Um, and it's not at all clear that the explanation for Zipf's law is going to go beyond notions of network theory, cell similarity, and other such areas which are still trying to understand why Zipf's law occurs. But you would not start looking at the level of neurons, connections, or nodes, to, or even above those to try and explain this kind of regularity. So to David's point, there are regularities and invariances and generalizations, and you need to be at the proper level of granularity to explain them. And it's very odd to believe that you would want to go down lower levels which don't have those invariances. Now, here's an example of, from Mike Strevens, where he gives the notion of the on the irrelevance of the causal underlayer, the case of the golden mole and the marsupial mole. This is kind of fun. You have two moles which are not related to each other, Right, one's a, mar uh, you know, one's a marsupial, the other one's a more advanced mammal. And what's interesting is that evolution converged on a very similar phenotype to be a mole. Right, so in other words, blind, snout, thick fur, big claws to go burrowing. 
Now, the point that Strebens makes is the complete explanation for the phenotype is its adaptive advantage. Thick claws, thick, big claws, thick fur, snout. And they're the same for these two types of mole. The underlying mechanisms for the evolution of the phenotype will be different because they have different developmental and evolutionary origins. Therefore, if you included two in your explanation of one, then they would no longer be the same explanation. So this is an example where you don't want to go to the causal underlayer because not only is it irrelevant, it will actually obscure the commonality, which is sufficient at the level of the adaptive advantage of the phenotype. Okay, so this is a very nice demonstration of how it's not at all helpful to go lower, it's in fact a problem. So similarly, we have to consider the possibility that we're going to have to have different object of objects of explanation. And as we know, beautiful work, actually, uh, Mitchell Ostro was speaking here in Cambridge. Uh, David Cicillo has made a similar point that the dynamical objects, and we use that word in the paper, um, are these topological invariances, you know, bistable attractors, line attractors. Uh, and these are made at the level of a population and they are the fundamental units of computation that are operating on the representation, which might be geometric and read off from one area to another in terms of the geometry of the representation. But the computation is these invariant dynamical objects uh, that have a topological structure and they can only be constructed at the population level. Um, so, can neural data be a, be a first level explainer of cognition? In other words, can we use neural data in a way that makes us intuit the you know, thinking and cognition in the same that we, they, that we use Sherringtonian connectivity to intuit how a stretch reflex works? Um, I think perhaps, yes, that perhaps if we can think of the representations at the geometry of trajectories in state space, and we can consider the computations, the topology of the invariance um, underlying dynamics, then perhaps we can begin to think um, of cognition using these pieces of neural information. Alternatively, and this is my position when I started this paper with David, was that we would probably always rely on a task level, level analysis. In other words, we'd have a fairly autom autonomous, sealed off level of explanation in terms of either psychological variables or even folk psychological variables, and that the neural data would only act to confirm our task level variables. So at the current time, I'm still find myself oscillating between task level analysis just with neural confirmation versus the idea that in fact, we will begin to be able to intuit and include neural data um, in our explanations of cognition. But if we do do that, it's going to have to be in terms of these population derived uh, dynamical objects and their subsequent representations. And I'll finish there. And uh, thanks, obviously, to David, um, who was an inspiration while we did this um, and gave a great summary of our paper. Thank you very much. few questions from people if they have it for David and then we'll move on to Tatiana and can John John can you hear me are you no okay <laughs> hi John <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I did you can hear us now maybe okay you hear that I had no idea whether you were hearing anything that I said yes yes you heard everything, you heard everything. It was lovely. It was lovely. Uh, thank you. That was a great talk. Uh, my question is about the irrelevance, irrelevance of the causal underlayer and the focus on first-level explana explanators. So uh, why do we have to determine only first-level explana explanations are important? Because if you consider the main relevance of uh, cognition and understanding of that is psychiatry. Like if you 
uh, if we kind of uh, dis decide that high level manifolds are important and low level like even GABA or some, some other receptors can be causing these uh, high level manifolds to change and if we want to finally manipulate causally uh, in psychiatric symptoms say for example, we want to target drugs, that would be really important to know the circuit level underpinnings. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. So if we're going to causally intervene, ultimately some of the causal facts are going to be relevant. So for example, in the case of psychiatry. But consider the case of an explanation of why a bird's wing generates lift. So the bird's wing generates lift as a result of n numerous different causal mechanisms that refer to the, the particulars, the physical particulars of the, of the construction of the wing and so forth. Nonetheless, the explanation of why the bird's wing generates lift has to do with various morphological characteristics of the wing. You screen off a lot of that low-level causal detail. If I want to fix the wing, I need to get into the dirty details about the causal facts. If I'm just trying to give an explanation for why the wing generates lift, then I'm going to end up screening off those facts. And something similar is going on in this case. I will say, though, that um, it isn't obvious to me that some of these dynamical details aren't relevant to understanding psychiatric dysfunction. So for example, um, OCD I know has received this really fascinating explanation in terms of wells and tractor spaces in the ACC, OFC, I think basal ganglia circuit that goes awry in that dysfunction. Um, in terms of the wells of a tractor being too deep is one model. I think Deco et al. have that model and Ed Rolls has a model I think where um, the energy barriers are too high to get out of the wells of attraction. So there are ways to try to explain psychiatric dysfunction even using these concepts and these objects, these neurodynamical systems. So on the one hand, there's no question that you're going to need to refer to the underlying details because we're specifically interested in treating a particular subset of the, of, of the phenomena, the, those cases where things go awry. But on the other hand, there might still be insight that we can glean by taking that perspective. Thank you, really interesting discussion. Um, it seems to me that there is um, potentially a link between these two views, uh, and that is via learning. Um, for you to solve a task, you need to modify your connections, uh, which then result on the manifold representation, right? So. It's not clear to me that's a really clear cut between the two views because you need, there's growing evidence to support the case that there is uh, the need for specific cell types, for example, to implement specific forms of learning, which then arise or give rise to specific representations. Yeah. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think the case of learning, uh, we had a dinner last night where learning occupied a non-insubstantial fraction of the time. Um, I think the case of learning is really interesting. So. Um, uh, it might be that learning presents one of these overlap areas, like you're suggesting. Um, I floated the idea, we're getting a little bit to my edge of my expertise here, because I'm not sure how the loss functions are constructed, for example, for backprop for some of the artificial neural networks and so forth. But I can imagine constructing loss functions based on manifolds as opposed to based on, you know, propagating error throughout the low-level um, circuit. I'm not sure. Um, but it seems to me that I, that's an interesting case that's definitely worthy of debate and whether or not we can explain learning totally at the level of the manifold or manifold-like computations and operations, or is it really a special domain? And when we're, this distinction really arises in the concrete form of the system after learning has ceased. Um, okay, it seems to me that there might be two axes along which uh, the explanatory power of the two views changes. One, obviously, is um, the size of the system, right? Thinking of, a, I don't know, a computer, if you've just got a few transistors, then, yeah, the Hopfieldian one is probably less uh, useful than the Sh Sharrington one. Um, but, you know, as it gets larger and, you know, you go from a hardware explanation to a software explanation. Um, and the same in the case for the brain, um, it might also be along the, um, you know, as you go from the sensory periphery, to higher level, um, you know, errors cognition, for instance, and then back to motor outputs. In the retina, for instance, a uh, um, Sharingtonian view might be more useful, while uh, the higher you get, uh, you get to Hopfield. And, you know, where exactly that change is, it's unclear to me. Like, I, I personally would probably put it beyond V1 or maybe even V2. Um, but, you know, I guess that is to some degree an empirical question. Yeah, so uh, certainly in the paper and in various talks I've given on this, 
we do state that sensory motor systems are probably more susceptible, more likely to receive sharing tony and explanations. I don't, in principle, there's no reason to think that spatial temporal size matters here. I can imagine a Lilliputian human, right? Very small, that has the full complex cognitive suite as a normal size human. I imagine a giant that has a very simple brain. Um, so, uh, but I do take the point as intended, which is that in general, as an empirical matter, it might be the case that complexity, which roughly tracks size in some ways, might be a good clue as to the type of explanation that one should uh, provide for the different types of system. So, hi, it's very good talk. So I, my question is very quick. So do you think uh, this two point of view is arise just from the mixed select selectivity of neurons or it's provide more? I personally feel like uh, the dynamical system view is like, uh, oh, I, I feel like the hope field view point is like a, uh, Re, it's like you using a dynamical system for language to re-describe the, the sharing trend view. Thank you. Yeah, so the case of mixed selectivity is really interesting. Certainly it's the case that you can get, generate these manifolds using populations of mixed selective nodes or neurons. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that we're trying to characterize the level at which there are these invariances. So there's gonna be many different networks with many different response profiles across many different instances of systems that can perform the same cognitive function. And our contention is that the regularity then won't rise at the level of those descriptions. There'll be a heterogeneous collection of systems and the evident principles that can underlie their performances that we're trying to describe will only be clear when we shift to thinking about manifolds because these different systems with different protect yeah, see, yeah, the different particulars will give rise to the same manifold. So there you're screening off those differences and you're able to arrive at a description of irregularity that applies to each of the system. Whereas if you, the, cool. I think we have time for just one more, but there will be a panel afterwards with lots of time for questions. <laughs> yeah, me, I guess, for the last one. Cool, thanks. Thanks, guys, this is really great. Um, I'm wondering if, talk a little bit about the relationship between your hot field and Sherentonian views and the actual dimensionality of the system. So you gave an example that the control in, a, in the hot field system might be great because it's a low dimensional system, it's great, but is there any necessary reason why the hot fielding system should be low dimensional and the Sherentonian system high dimensional? I remember since you recall or see in your paper, you talk about the fact that uh, a Sherentonian view is consistent with cell assemblies right? and cell assemblies are going to be a low dimensional representation. So <clears throat> are these two things orthogonal or are they the same? So yeah, that view, uh, sorry, that argument is certainly an inductive one, so it's not, it's not a deductive one. So there's gonna be cases where you have Sherringtonian type systems whose effective dimensionality is lower. For example, the case you just mentioned where there may be many, many neurons, but they're grouped in certain ways such that the control problem is simplified. But the general case of, for example, like the examples that were just discussed a moment ago, where you have many, many neurons and they all have these different response profiles, mixed selective response profiles, is going to be one where it might be easier just because you've, you face this gnarly control problem if you actually have to dial into each of the individual neurons as opposed to some sort of coarse graining where you just have to manipulate the manifolds. Okay, great. Uh, what happens now? Now we have Tatiana. Okay. Should I detach everything? Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. <laughs> All right, um, thanks for the opportunity to present um, maybe slightly different view in, in this debate. Um, I would like to steer conversation more towards understanding cognition on the level of circuit mechanisms. And I guess everyone would agree that ultimately 
brain is a network of neurons wired via connections. And of course, there are many other aspects of the nervous system, such as neuromodulators, which are part of it. But um, to a large degree, the cognition, I guess everyone would agree, ultimately arising from interactions of these many neurons via connectivity structure in the circuit. And um, not surprisingly, for a very long time, traditionally, to understand cognitive phenomena, theorists designed models which would explain how connectivity structure in a circuit would give rise to dynamics necessary to perform a cognitive function. This is one of the very famous examples, a model of decision making, where there are two pools of excited neurons which are wired with clustered connectivity, with connection strengths stronger within the clusters and across clusters to drive a winner take all competition so that one of those populations can elevate the firing rate to signal the choice. Well, in this type of models, they're actually very powerful because we have a full understanding starting from the connectivity structure in the circuit, leading to the activity in the circuit, resulting from dynamics, and ultimately to the circuit function. And here I would like to disagree that dynamical system level description is unique to the Hopefieldian view, because for a very long time, dynamical system theory was a primary tool to understand how the circuits function. For example, this system has two attractors representing the two opposing choices, and dynamics will flow towards one of those attractors, and this is how computation happens. And moreover, with this level of understanding going all uh, the way down to the circuit level, we are able to make very specific predictions about how the system will behave under specific circuit perturbations, such as, for example, changing excitation and inhibition balance in the circuit will uh, result in changes in the speed and accuracy of decisions in the system, which could be verified experimentally. So I guess as a theorist, we strive to derive such theories where we can make very specific predictions for causal perturbation experiments so that we can actually go and test our understanding on the causal level. Well, while these models are powerful, and they actually, I don't have time to cite all this work on my slides, but they have been actually tested to a large uh, extent uh, using modern tools like optogenetics and behaving animals. They're also somewhat limited because they produce these functionally homogeneous neural responses, which we know is not the case in many cortical networks. Here is a very famous example from uh, Valerio Monti and David Cecilio. And in this experiment, they recorded neural activity in monkeys, also performing a decision-making task. But in this case, stimulus had two features, color of the dots, red or green, and motion direction of the dot. And monkey had to choose based on either color or motion feature of the stimulus depending on the context cue. So it's a slightly more complicated decision task which requires you to process multiple task variables to uh, produce a decision. And what is shown here is an example of a few neurons from prefrontal cortex of monkeys engaged in this task. And activity of those neurons is sorted by different combinations of these task variables. And what you can appreciate, it's not a clear distinction that some neurons respond to, respond to motion and some neurons only respond to choice. Instead, what we see is that each task variable seems to be distributed across many neurons, and each individual neuron responds to a combination of all different task variables. So this distributed mixed selectivity appears at first sight in conflict with this view of neurons wired in well-defined circuits. Um, and to understand how computation happens in such systems, the manifold approach becomes very powerful. So rather than trying to understand functional properties of individual neurons, we go to neural population state space, looking for their collective activity, and using dimensionality reduction tools, we derive these very interpretable pictures of neural computation, which are often called neural manifolds. So here is an example for this task where we can identify axes in neural state space, which we can call motion axis and choice axis, such that activity will along this axis, axis will correlate with features of the motion stimulus or animal's choice, and they become very interpretable. Interestingly enough, 
If you train recurrent neural network models to perform this task, you can also obtain in these networks representations which have many of these properties. They have also distributed mixed selectivity and very similar manifolds. So if you think about it, recurrent neural network is also a type of neural circuit model. It is built out of nodes wired in the network. However, after training in large networks of this type, there is no simple relationship between connectivity and neural responses. The connectivity looks complex and neural responses also appear complex. And although we can derive simple explanations on the level of manifold in these networks, it is a common belief that mechanisms which give rise to emergence of this manifold in distributed systems are qualitatively different from the familiar neural circuit solutions which we know from hand-wired neural circuits. And the idea is that in these networks, something qualitatively new is emerging just because of the scale of the system. Today, I will present you some work from uh, my lab, which actually shows the contrary to this view, that low dimensional structure in neural activity, in some cases, can be linked to a low dimensional structure in the connectivity of the circuit. And I would argue that finding this relationship between activity and connectivity is very important because it will give us the power of neural circuit models to generate testable predictions for causal perturbation experiments to test our understanding of how the cognition arises. So the work I will present you today is from Chris Langdon, who is a postdoc in the lab. And he developed an approach which we call a latent circuit inference approach, where we infer the structure, the latent circuit structure in the network uh, from heterogeneous neural response data. And I will show you how we apply this framework to understand the circuit mechanism underlying the context-dependent decision-making task from Monte and Cecilio in recurrent neural network models. Chris also used it to understand how it happens in prefrontal cortex, but I will have no time to go into this. All right, so the first uh, um, thing that we, when we think about, when we think about neural manifolds is a dimensionality reduction approach. First, we need to find uh, looking in this high dimensional neural state space and during the task there will be some trajectories traced out by the system, we need to find some low dimensional subspace, some projection from this high dimensional uh, subspace which will represent task relevant variables. And when we think about task, usually we think about task variables in the particular task um, I presented to you. We think about motion, color, choice, context, and we want this to become our axis in this uh, low dimensional subspace. And one of the common ways to do it is to perform some form of regression or correlation based analysis. So we are looking for this matrix Q where every column will correspond to a direction in the neural state space, right? It's a vector representing axis in the neural population state space, which will correlate with one of the task variables. On the other hand, each row in this matrix will represent how much every neuron in the population is influenced by each of the task variables. That's a very typical approach, and it all often gives us very interpretable pictures. However, if you think about it, it's very contrary to how, like, from perspective of circuit models. Because in circuit models, variables, um, which are nodes in a circuit and receive inputs about specific task information, need to interact with each other via recurrent connectivity to produce computation, to transform inputs to the outputs. If we just look for pure representation of task variables, such as motion or color in orthogonal dimensions, they don't influence each other, and therefore, they will not be reflective of the computation necessary to capture behavior. And therefore, we move towards thinking about dimensionality reduction approach from the circuit, mechanistic circuit perspective. We will also be seeking for low dimensional projection of high dimensional neural, of, of neural responses. However, within this low dimensional space, we will allow our task variables to interact with each other as nodes in a latent circuit via low dimensional recurrent connectivity. And we will find both the embedding matrix Q, 
and the recurrent interaction matrix by fitting your response data. So let me unpack here the model a little bit more. So in our model, we also have an embedding matrix Q, such that transpose of it give us dimensionality reduction, projection from high dimensional space to low dimensional space. But within this low dimensional space, we constrain our latent variables, denoted here as X, to follow uh, equations of a low dimensional network, which we call the latent circuit. In this network, there is a recurrent connectivity structure which implements a mechanism by which these task variables interact. And because it's low dimensional, it also will be interpretable. We can always sketch it out as a circuit diagram to understand how interactions happened via excitation and inhibition. And we will find this uh, uh, structure by fitting neural response data. So existence of these latent circuits is not obvious. A priori, in principle, it could be that uh, high dimensional recurrent networks use very different mechanisms, in which case, if we try to fit a model like this to recurrent neural network, we will not be able to obtain a good fit. However, if we can successfully explain responses of an RNN with our latent circuit model, it would suggest that RNN is actually using this low dimensional circuit structure. So this theory allows us also um, to go further and establish relationships between the high dimensional system and the low dimensional circuit inside it. So in particular, because we search for embedding, for linear embedding of this circuit, we have relationship between every node in a latent circuit and a high dimensional activity pattern or direction in the neural state space of a high dimensional system. But moreover, we can take this relationship also all the way down to the connectivity level. So in particular, this is our mapping of trajectories between high dimensional and low dimensional system. And we can differentiate it and in a few steps derive relationship between their connectivity. So once again, Q is the embedding matrix which maps low dimensional responses on high dimensional responses. And what you can see here is that low, uh, low dimensional recurrent latent connectivity, W rec, uh, small letter here, is actually a hidden low dimensional structure inside the connectivity of large network, which we can find by conjugating the high dimensional connectivity with the matrix Q. So that's a very clear prediction. If we obtain good fit uh, of neural trajectories, we also expect to find the relationship between the connectivity. And moreover, um, it also gives us opportunity um, to relate every individual connection in a latent circuit to a distributed connectivity pattern in a high dimensional system given by uh, a low rank term corresponding to outer product of two columns of the matrix Q. So let's see how it works in RNNs. So we trained RNNs to perform uh, the motion color discrimination task. And here is psychometric function just showing that the network learned the task successfully. Uh, in color context trials, it responds to color coherence and it's ignoring motion stimulus. So the network learned to do the task. If you look in connectivity of this network, it looks very mixed and distributed at the first sight. There is no obvious structure. But what we can do, we can fit our latent circuit model to responses of this network. And what we find is actually a very interpretable mechanism. This is a um, recurrent connectivity learned from responses of high dimensional network. So we see a pattern of checkerboard connections from sensory nodes to choice nodes representing alternative stimulus response mappings. And we also see inhibitory connections from context nodes to sensory nodes, which will inhibit irrelevant mapping to select the relevant one. So just to give you an idea, this is the same connectivity sketched out of the circuit diagrams. We have motion right and color right nodes projecting to the choice right output node. And the same for motion left and color left nodes. These are two alternative stimulus response mappings. And then context node will inhibit one of those mappings in each context to only allow the, select, uh, the relevant one to drive the choice. Well, the structure we found is not different from what was already hypothesized in multiple neural circuit models fired by hand many years ago. Well, in this point, you can say, well, maybe that's the only way a small circuit can do the task. And it's actually not representative of how the large system is solving the task. And because that's the only way the small circuit can do it, 
That's why we found this solution. So likely we can use our theory to prove the existence of this mechanism in the high dimensional system directly. So first of all, we can conjugate the high dimensional RNN connectivity with the matrix Q. And we find a good correspondence um, with the connectivity inferred in the latent circuit. We can also find evidence of this mechanism in dynamics of the RNN because our latent circuit also give us a dimensionality reduction. So the same way we can project activity of RNN on directions defined by the columns of the matrix Q and find representation of context and choice. But more interestingly, if we project on color direction in the latent circuit model, what we see is that color information is suppressed when it's irrelevant. So in motion context, color representation is suppressed, consistent with the inhibitory mechanism we found in connectivity. And the same is true for motion. But ultimately, we can also test this model, these perturbations directly in RNN, both by perturbing activity and connectivity of RNN. And I will only show you connectivity perturbations because I think that's the most powerful uh, evidence. So for example, so latent circuit is a fully functional model of a task, and it's interpretable. So we can predict how perturbing any connection in the latent circuit should affect behavior of the network. In particular, if we weaken inhibitory connection from motion context nodes to sensory nodes representing color, we predict that this perturbation should weaken the efficacy of the contextual mechanism, and the result makes the network sensitive to irrelevant color information. So this is what indeed happening here. You see the sensitivity as a shift, as a rotation in the psychometric function. But our ability to translate perturbations from low dimensional circuit on the high dimensional network gives also very specific predictions that if we perturb the corresponding pattern, a distributed pattern of connections in the RNN, we should expect to see the same change in the psychometric function of the distributed recurrent network. And it is indeed what we find. So to conclude, um, we suggest that um, latent circuit is a low dimensional structure that enables causal interactions between directions on a neural manifold divided by columns of the embedding matrix Q. And we successfully found this structure in RNNs trained to perform cognitive tasks, which reveals that RNNs actually don't use different mechanisms than those familiar to us from small handcrafted neural circuit models. And this gives us the power to validate this mechanism by very precise causal manipulations of the high dimensional system directly. And I don't have um, really time uh, to go into what other people did to establish similar relationships between circuit structure and the corresponding low dimensional manifold structure in many systems. But uh, together with Chris and another postdoc in the lab, Michael Genkin, we recently wrote a review where we go in all those beautiful examples from the literature which able to establish these connections between low dimensional dynamics and low dimensional connectivity. And we argue that finding this structure is very important because if you just face with neural responses, there are a thousand ways to project them on different low dimensional subspaces, which can give you very different interpretations of the data. And without ways to causally test which of those representation is driving behavior, is causally linked to behavior, we will be left with uncertainty without clear paths uh, to selecting the relevant one. So I would like to thank everyone in my lab, in particular Chris LinkedIn, whose work I presented today, also organizers and other adversaries. Thank you. Very good talk. I, very good talk. So I, I really like this method. I actually use this method, but I, I'm in a problem. So, so I feel like this problem can learn a, a low dimensional dynamics, but uh, it cannot learn a, a, a very complex dynamics. So imagine if I want to try, I want to use this method to learn an attractor, but the, the local geometry is low dimensional, but uh, the local geometry is different everywhere. So it looks like a warped circle. So I feel like uh, this type of like distillation 
just to ignore the complexity of the dynamics is only preserve the, the low dimensional structure. So in other words, do you think this kind of complexity of the dynamic mix is important? Or if it is important, uh, do you, do you, which way do you think can preserve the geometry of this kind of complexity of the dynamics? Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. So in artificial neural networks trained to be, be uh, trained to perform this very simple task, which we often study, the dynamics which emerge are actually not very complex. So when we train these RNNs to do the task, they're approximately eight dimensional, and this is how many variables we have in the task. So those latent circuit models capture about more than 90%, like 95, 96% of variability in those RNNs. They're very good approximations. Of course, when we look in responses from prefrontal cortex, they're way more higher dimensional than what we see in RNNs. And there are various reasons for this. One reason is that prefrontal neurons represent not only these input and output variables, which I consider today, right? They also represent information about previous choice, previous reward. And we know that all these other signals also influence how animal is making a decision. So one hypothesis is that there are more nodes in this latent circuit structure representing all these different factors that are internal variables computed by the system. And then it becomes like practically, it becomes a question of model selection, right? Like how do we grow those models to account for as much variance as possible in neural responses? But there are also another possibility that not all variance which we see in neural data is related to the execution of this particular behavioral task which we study. It's not crazy to imagine that there are other dimensions of variations which are not linked in a causal way to execution of this behavioral task. So another important aspect to consider is that maybe capturing all variances of data should not be necessarily the goal. And here the causal manipulation can give us a way for performance this model selection. Um, in a different way, when we don't just try to use cross-validation, but we try to kind of trade off between how much variance we capture versus how much behavior can we explain with our model. Okay. Okay. Hi, many thanks for having me here. Um, I'm James, and first this is James. I'm really sorry I'm not there in person. And I feel particularly silly about that because I, I, I'm, well, I live in Oxford. Um, and so I hope this virtual presentation is some sort of substitute, but I'm sorry once again. Um, so I've been asked to talk about Sherringtonian-like representations readily emerge in networks with biological constraints and are computationally useful. Um, and another title for this uh, talk is, is um, Computational Representations for Flexible Behavior. So we're going to start this talk first by thinking about flexibility and, and, and see that it really requires a model of the world. So here's a rodent um, who's been trained to run around this barrier to receive a ward. I hope you can see my mouse right now. Um, and, but when a new opening appears, repeating these old actions is no longer optimal. Instead, taking this shortcut is. But the rodent can only know that. If it knows that this location connects with this location. And that's exactly what a model of the world offers. It says how states in the world uh, relate to each other. And of course, we don't just want to model this single uh, setting with its shortcut. We want models of the world that work in any setting, like this one here, so we can behave optimally as fast as possible. Thus, the game is how can we build a model of the world as fast as possible for any new situation. And one particularly attractive option is to break down our world model into building blocks. For example, the building block of space, the building block of reward, the building block of walls, and just like how children can compose these blocks in together in one configuration or in another. And we can do the same thing with these um, constituent world model blocks and build a new world model in any new situation. So the game is going to be, well, the question really is how on earth are these building blocks represented in neurons? So luckily, we, are, we have lots of recordings of spatial cells and entorhinal cortex that really do look like building blocks. So what you're seeing here is a top-down view of a box this black trajectory is where this animal has run, and a red dot is um, every time a, a single cell has fired. So you can see that this cell likes to fire whenever the animal is on a triangular grid. And, and there are lots of other of these grid cells found, and they really do just care about representing space and space alone. 
We also find cells that care about objects, and these object vector cells that fire at a certain distance and direction away from objects. So this cell here always fires at five steps northwest of, of, of this white object, and this one's always maybe six steps to the, to the west. Um, and you also find border cells, these cells that just care about borders. So it really does look like interanimal cortex is representing these, these building blocks. Um, and I say sorry again for, for, well, now this time lying to you so early on in the talk. Um, and it's, it's not the case, however, that um, it's always such a clean decomposition into building blocks. Sometimes these cells or building blocks, they sort of blend together. Um, so here is a grid cell um, here on the left uh, that's um, after a while of being in this environment where these uh, black dots are rewards, uh, the fields of this grid cell, they sort of walk towards the rewards. Here's one cell and here's another where this field has walked towards that reward. Um, so this cell is no longer representing just space, it's representing sort of space and rewards. It's got this sort of, uh, well, it's warped. So there's a bit of a, um, bit of a funky thing there. Um, and that sort of phenomena of these building blocks and sometimes warping or mixed selectivity isn't a phenomena that's restricted to the hippocampal formation. So here's a parietal cell that only cares about, um, there's a single cell that only cares about when the animal's doing his teammate's task and doesn't care about when the animal's doing his steering wheel um, task. And here's another cell that doesn't care about the only animal's doing a teammate's task, but only cares about the steering wheel task. And this modularity is true across the whole population. Cells either tend to care for one task or the other. So you also see things like that in PFC. But of course, you also see mixed selectivity all over the brain as well. It's sort of cells that seem to care about lots of things. Um, so that's uh, um, also another funky thing. Well, same funky thing. So this overall question of when the cells care about um, one thing or many things is a really is a big thing in machine learning as well. It's called disentanglement. Um, and so uh, what this is about um, is, well, as normal, these machine learners, they make the assumption that um, they have some data and it's generated from a set of independent, uh, um, independent factors. And the aim of the machine learner is to take this data and try to infer what these underlying general sort of factors are. And they want to know what each factor is um, because you know, that's helpful for interpretability. So to do this, they take some observation vector and they map it in some latent space for our deep net, where they apply all sorts of constraints so that single model neurons care about single factors of variation, that's disentanglement. And you can do this and it really works. So for example, you can train on lots of images of objects of different colors, shapes, positions, and sizes. Um, and then you can find neurons that either care about, well, this neuron, sorry, only cared about the y-axis. This one um, cares about the x-axis, x location of the object. And this neuron only cares about the size of the object. So it really does work. And these middle models also predict neuroscience data as well. If you train these models on faces and show you the same faces um, to, to monkeys, then you can match up single model neurons to single monkey infratemporal cortex neurons as well, as well. So again, more evidence that the brain seemingly likes to have neurons that care about these single factors at a time. Okay, so we have quite some puzzles to solve. Um, the first one is why do neurons sometimes prefer to care about single variables, like these uh, grid cells that only care about space, or these object vector cells that only care about objects? Why do they sometimes seemingly code for multiple human interpretable factors, like so this grid cell that's now warped to care about grid and rewards, grid space and rewards? Um, and like, if we try to answer this, can we uncover some general principles that aren't just true for you know, the hippocampal system and space, but you know, true for not just uh, for other brain areas and also for machines? Um, well, and possibly, if, if we're lucky, well, we won't get to this one. Um, the question is like, why does each cell look the way it does? Well, just like machine learners, um, we're going to think about what are the constraints, um, but this time the constraints of biology imposes on representations. So let's think about some of these constraints. The first constraint is that neurons have to be useful. So if the neurons are representing some tasks which have components X, Y, and Z, then the neurons themselves need to contain some information about X, Y, and Z. Second, neurons need to uh, obey the rules of biology. So neurons can't spike negatively. So this isn't allowed, but this is. Uh, and also the brain um, doesn't have infinite resources, so it wants activity to be low. So a bit more like this. Of course, there's other constraints um, that biology has as well, but these are the ones we're going to consider right now. So I'm going to try to give you some intuition about how these constraints lead to disentanglement. So here we've got two neurons, and they're coding for these independent variables E1 and E2. 
Uh, and so we can see that E1 here is, proje is, um, uh, is projected along this neural axis, and E2 is projected along this neural axis. And here I'm showing how much energy the neurons are using. Okay, but at the moment, um, there's negative activity down here, and that's not allowed, so we need to make it non-negative. We can rectify this by moving this whole distribution up, but it's come out as energy cost, since the neurons are now firing faster. So perhaps it's clear that the best thing we can do is fit this gray square as snugly as possible to reduce firing. But now something interesting has happened. Now each neuron just cares about a single factor. E1 is being projected along this neural axis, and E2 is being projected along this neural axis. So this is disentanglement. Uh, and this is something we can uh, prove in math too. Um, so that was some intuition and a flash of a proof. Um, but do these constraints actually work in practice? Um, so I'm going to try to elucidate this by training some artificial neural networks. So we're going to make a data set where the input and output are both scrambles of independent variables. And I've tried to visualize that by um, each neuron being colored by multiple different colors, by multiple different independent variables. And um, now we're going to train a, a, a simple neural network to predict this data. And so it's going to have some hidden layer. And we're going to put some biological constraints on. So the hidden uh, layer here, it needs to be non-negative. We're going to ask the activity to be small, and we're going to make the weight small as well, which is energy efficiency. And we're interested in what these hidden neurons look like. Do they care about mixtures of these random variables, or are they, or are they disentangled? Do they just care about one random variable at a time? Well, without the biological constraints, each neuron cares about multiple factors. For example, this neuron here cares about uh, lots of the factors, all to varying degrees. But with the biological constraints, each neuron cares about just a single factor at a time. So this neuron only cares about this factor, or this neuron only cares about this factor. That's disentanglement. So I haven't put uh, more figures in here, but when you remove any one of these constraints, um, this disentanglement goes away. And this whole thing works in a much you know, wider variety of nonlinearities and so on, and more interesting data as well. Um, the, but one piece of data I'm going to show is uh, sort of a more standard machine learning benchmark. So here's a data set with images of objects of different shapes, sizes, colors, and viewing angle. And the walls and floors and, uh, and can have different colors too. And let's train one of these machine learning algorithms where they've taken some input data and they project it to a latent space. But now we're not going to put all of their bespoke uh, constraints on, we're just going to have our biological constraints. And we can visualize what these single model neurons care about. We can see that this neuron down here only cares about viewing angle. This neuron cares about object shape. These neurons don't care about anything, neither do these two, but these ones care about single um, factors as well, disentanglement. Um, and it turns out that our constraints actually do a better job than, um, uh, than most machine learning algorithms. So they, um, all the biological constraint models here, so each dot is a model, um, biological constraints ones, they disentangle well and they fit the data well. You'll just have to trust me a little bit on that. Okay, um, so that what are brain representations. I'm going to try to show you now the same principles that explain why sometimes cells care about building blocks, like, like we saw here, and why they sometimes blend together. So just like those images that were made up of independent factors, I'm going to make a spatial task made up of independent factors. So I'm going to sometimes ask an agent to run around the room or um, this particular arrangement of those objects, and sometimes in other arrangements, like this one. But crucially, there's never going to be a consistent arrangement of objects. Space and objects are independent from each other. Objects can appear anywhere. And then I'm going to train a recurrent neural network um, to predict where I am in space and whether there's an object there or not. Well, without the biological constraints, we only find these sort of amorphous light grid cells, and they look similar whether there's a task with objects or without. I promise you there are some differences there, but it's hard to see. Um, but with the biological constraints, we see these two populations of cells, grid cells and object vector cells, just like in the real brain. And this is a task with objects, but when we place, place this model in, a, in an environment without objects, we can see that the grid cells look just the same as before, no change at all, because they just care about space. But now these object vector cells, these cells that care about objects, they've turned off if there's no objects there. It really is these two populations of cells um, that, um, um, that each care about a single thing. So independent task factors plus biological constraints means that neurons represent building blocks in different neurons. OK, but what happens now if you leave objects in the same location? Well, now. There aren't, so we're only ever going to train in this environment. But now there aren't any independent factors to represent. Instead, the factors of space and objects, they're sort of entangled with each other. They, they don't occur in different, lots of different combinations. 
So now all the representative representations look a bit like this. So they kind of look a bit grid, grid firing. Um, but if you look closely, you can see that the firing fields all warp towards these white objects. So for this cell, for example, it always fires uh, uh, southeast of the object. But it's not an object vector cell because there's also other fields like there. It's like this grid cell which is warping. And each cell is like that. Um, and this is just like that warping that takes place um, in the cells as the animal is overtrained in the same environment configuration. And that's a crucial bit for these cells here. That warping only took place after quite a while. And that's the same, like, well, one can make the um, speculation that to that animal, that environment, um, space and re rewards have become entangled because it just repeated some behaviors over and over and over and over again in the same environment. So it offers an explanation for this warping. Okay, well, I'm going to try to revisit um, the questions that we saw earlier. So we just saw that um, biological constraints prefer neurons that only care about single independent variables. And this can explain why we see these separate cell types in entorhinal cortex and other brain regions. It's an explanation to why neuroscientists so often find cells that code for human interpretable factors. Well, we've, oh, there we go. But we've also given an explanation as to why sometimes cells become warped and entangled. Um, now, I'm not totally dogmatic about single neurons want to care about, always care about single things. Um, of course, there's lots of other reasons why things um, would mix. Um, okay, and general principle for space and brains, well, we've got that theory now, and that theory transferred to um, artificial neural networks as well. Uh, and why does each cell look the way it does? Well, I told you we weren't going to answer that, but here is a paper that's fun to read if you want to look like a right grid cell, looks like a grid cell. Okay, so what does this all mean for Hopfield and Sherrington? Well, um, over in the Hopfieldian um, area, we've got these sort of neural manifolds. And, uh, and this work is saying, I guess, was, is easily thought to be quite Sherringtonian. It says these single neurons should care about single things. Um, but that's not exactly what it's saying. It's not saying that every neuron is you know, exactly known, exactly what the purpose of that neuron is, and you can discover the neural circuit. It's just saying that, um, uh, what well, I said is saying sort of something somewhere in between in the Hoptonian. Uh, it's saying that um, if you have these independent task factors, uh, you might be able to discover separate cell types. You might not be able to tell exactly what that cell type will look like, but you might be able to sort of turn that one big manifold, um, that one big manifold of all the neurons, you might be able to subcategorize it into different submanifolds. So here there was a submanifold for space and a submanifold for objects. Um, and then we don't know exactly why these grid cells look like grid cells, or the object vector cells look like object vector cells. Um, but we nevertheless, the manifold decomposed into two, two different things. So some modular structure to the manifold, Hoptonian, I guess, is uh, where I stand on that. Um, but as I said, if you do want to check out why grid cells look like grid cells, uh, read that paper in World Oral. Um, anyway, sorry I'm not there. Uh, and um, thank you very much for listening, and thanks to uh, uh, people I work with and, and funders and so on. Okay, thank you. I hope the um, hope the debates for everything as well. Thanks. Damn. So maybe we can have the speakers come up and do a very quick panel, and then we'll have a second panel in the second half of the. Uh, <laughs> second half of the gag. All right, so the question is about a word that comes up in your description of sharing Tony and very frequently. Don't worry, you know, you know these words. OK. <laughs> you, you wrote them, so I hope you know them. OK. Um, very generous assumption. When you describe Sharon Tony and you, you say that basically the best explanation for cognitive phenomenon will involve uh, circuits made up of particular neurons uh, using particular neuron-to-neuron -neuron connections, uh, with fixed biological identities and using particular neurotransmitters. And so when we asked people this question on Twitter, basically most people said they disagreed with this, that the best explanations would use these particular neurons. Um, it was whatever, 65% said no. Explanations should not use particular neurons. So my question is really how much weight is on this word particular and what does it really mean? And the reason I ask is because when we remove that word, now, all of a sudden, only 50% of people disagree. And then when I rephrase it a little bit, again using your words, cognitive phenomena, you can also see it down there in front of you. Oh. Cognitive phenomena are well explained by just connections, 
formed by networks of nodes, weighted connections between them. Now we have 55% of people agree. So it seems like people's, the degree to which people agree to with the Sharontonian view yeah. really depends on this word particular. Yeah. And so I want to know what, what you mean by particular in terms of how much it matters for something being Sharontonian. Yeah, right, good. Um, so um, if it wasn't evident, I really do conceive of the different ways of explaining cognitive phenomena as lying on a spectrum. Yeah. So you have like a very hard line Sharingtonian view um, where it's going to be um, across instances of some phenomenon, you'll have the exact same neurons with the exact same connections to other neurons that are identical and replicated across those phenomena. And you can relax those constraints as you've done here. And I think what this suggests to me is that there's a latent Hopfieldian drive and the more Hopfieldian the question becomes, the more people you, you'll get. You, you would say that getting rid of particular moves you towards Hopfieldian. Sure, but I mean, you're still, uh, in, you know, still in the orbit of the Sherry-Antonian pole. And then um, as you relax some of those constraints, the question is, what is, is there a m precise middle ground? And, and I'm still unclear on what that, things also get more vague and fuzzy in the middle between the two. Because um, it seems to me, like, for example, James' alternative is that there are going to be these regularities that you can capture that don't clearly fall um, into the Sherringtonian camp, perhaps because they don't specify specific connectivity patterns, or they quantify over them in various interesting ways, um, but that aren't necessarily um, manifold-level descriptions either. And so I, one of the ways that I conceptualize this workshop is to try to understand if there is a viable intermediate position like that. Um, but it is the case that in presenting the views, it's helpful to characterize the poles in their most extreme form. You get clear on them. You can clearly identify what it would take to be an instance of such. And then you can start relaxing those constraints and, and moving around to it. Does anyone else want to say anything about that? Um, so I think hopefully getting, for, for me, I think figuring out where that middle view is, and it seems to really rely around statistical circuits, statistical descriptions of circuits, where now you're not talking about particular neurons, but you're talking about statistical properties of the, of the weight matrix of the network. Right, so it's important, this won't surprise you because this came up at dinner, came up before at the um, symposium today. It's important to identify what's doing the representing, what's doing the computing, and so forth. If you just say, oh, I have a weight matrix with these statistical properties, that sounds to me like a second level explainer of a manifold, potentially, um, because you haven't identified, I mean, it's a, a, a weight matrix is a static description of a circuit. It's not specifying the computations, it's not specifying the representations. So to have a viable alternative, you need to have some sort of functional explanatory object. And mere specification of the weight matrix, that's just going to be a second level explainer. Um, so I guess, if I understand correctly what you're saying, uh, with regards to what James was saying, which is in general like a place cell, I don't think people will be thinking that a Sherrington explanation is that there are specific place cells. It's more that the circuit will end up having place cells and that there's not particular connections that exist between pre-known cells. It's just that we can understand the circuit in terms of place cells and grid cells. And there's no, there's no, there's no, def there's no use of the term particular there in that definition. And I don't think to remove it makes it more Hopfieldian. It's kind of a pure Sherrontonian without the without the particular. Well, um, I would say it does make it an impure Sherrontonian, but I think more importantly is that maybe it's, we both agree that that is in the Sherrontonian sure. sphere of influence. Yeah, okay. And I agree with that. That's, I think that's right, yeah. Um, so um, I wanted to actually look at the same question from another angle. Um, so this, is, this has become a trend in, in also in deep learning and AI research, specifically in the domain of interpretability, um, to try to um, take a network that we kind of understand at the representational level, level and try to um, disentangle different parts of this network that then can be assigned directly to different modules of the task or different um, specializations, let's say. 
And this is also, I think, related to both James' talk and Tatiana's talk. Um, I assumed from your talk and partly from, um, from John's talk that it is either unnecessary or it's even implausible to do so. Can I take a network that I understand at a representational level and I understand it in a, in a, in a Hopfieldian sense of it, and can I reach a Sherringtonian understanding? This, is, this has been kind of an assumption in deep learning in the interpretability domain, but I assume that from what you're talking about and what you're proposing, it is not possible or it's even implausible. Great, yeah, so that to me strikes me as an empirical question, actually. I think in some networks it might be plausible to do that, in other networks it may not be plausible to do that. Um, and I think you just have to look at the, the you know, single units or in, the, in either biological or artificial networks and you have to see what their activation functions are and whether or not they're tuned to task parameters. Um, I do want to make a comment about the starting with a, an a priori description of the task. So like the Monte et al, they have this QR decomposition, it's driven by these task variables. They're actually decomposing the ordinary least squares linear weights out of the smooth neural firing matrix regression. So there is this assumption from right from the get-go that we've identified the relevant variables to begin with. And they're the obvious things you might think of in like a dot motion task for that example. But one of the neat things for me, for example, from the Son et al paper is that they were able to induce the existence of this neural speed setting variable, that is not a task variable. That's a variable that was posited on the basis of a, a sort of a task agnostic decomposition, just a PCA, and they looked at what might the relationship be between the features of the trajectories in the manifold space in the estimation epoch and how could those relate to the features that were observed during the production epoch. And so for me, that actually serves as a better, maybe less, more ag task agnostic or bottom up or however you want to characterize a description of what's going on. If you always assume that you're going to just run your regressions on predefined task variables, you're liable to miss out on a whole wealth of computations that result from the construction of internal variables, transformations of those internal variables to other internal va variables that ultimately give rise to behavior. So, in, and in that instance, it's not clear to me I would maybe posit it would be less likely that you'll be able to perform that kind of reduction, starting with the hop fielding and description, and then reduce it to the single unit activation functions. Um, so, you know, I think some of this is not just an empirical question, it's also are you starting with an a priori definition of what you think the relevant variables are that you need to run your regressions against? And I think, unless Tatiana has something that she wants to say about that, we'll take a little break and then come back and. <laughs> right, so uh, to your last point, yeah, I think it's a very important consideration what are the variables which neural circuit represents, what should be the axis of neural manifold. And there was some work which I find interesting, for example, from Adam Kapish lab, which showed that, well, if you look in neural representations in orbital frontal cortex during some complex decision-making task, if um, you look for internal structure of these neural responses, then, then they tend to find functional clustering. And they tend to find that there are groups of neurons which have very similar response profiles and which respond in some interpretable way to combinations of variables necessary so, to solve the task, but these are not external sensory variables. Right? So this, these are some internal variables such as confidence, for example. Confidence is not something provided from outside. It's something animal estimates, like how confident they are in their decision. Um, and they show that if instead they would be using just external task variables, everything would be mixed and distributed. Right? So I guess it's a nice showcase that like, when we talk about like, structure of mixed selectivity, it's, if it's all completely just random, or there is structure, we should be thinking about like with respect to what variables are we studying this representation. Great, so we're gonna do a 20 minute break at this point and then we have two more talks and a lot more time of discussion with everyone. So. <laughs> Excellent. So in the interest of time, we're going to get started. Um, hope everyone enjoyed their coffee break.
Um, so what we're going to do in this next half is uh, have two quick talks, and then we're going to go back to another panel now with uh, everyone who's been up and kind of try to focus in the second panel on what do the two views actually say that might be able to be directly compared? Like, is it, are they just two different ways of looking at things, or is there something that we can do to, to directly compare the views, maybe even in the same experiment or with the same models? Um, but first, we're going to have two talks, one from Johnny, one from John Yen, uh, both about using, again, neural network systems and what seems to fit in either Sherentonian or Hopfieldian type analyses. So here's John. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, so this is going to be quite a quick overview of some work we've been doing in the lab. And I guess, in, in some sense, it contributed to the motivation of organizing this gag or submitting to organize this gag because from, from reading the, the, the literature, we, we weren't really sure, I wasn't really sure where this kind of fits in. So um, what I mean by that is I'm going to talk about kind of a quite Sherentonian level concept, which is synaptic geometry. Um, and we're, we're, we're looking at how, by understanding synaptic geometry, you can understand the computational solutions the system converges to, which, um, from my naive, my naive understanding, was a more Hopfieldian level analysis. So it was really just to understand, like, where does this type of work fit in on that axis? Is it somewhere between the two? And how does it interact? And so I guess, I mean, already I think the term synaptic geometry is slightly, um, it needs to be unpacked a little bit. And so by this, I just mean, if you have different synaptic configurations, as in configurations of synaptic weights, um, which weights are close to each other and which are further away for the cell. Um, and so by that, I mean you need a, you need a distance function. Um, and already in terms of physical distance, kind of it's already, we can already say that there's, there's multiple ways to measure distance between two points. Now, in general, we, we, I think we're very used to thinking of Euclidean distance or the straight line between two points. But this is not the only distance function you can choose, and it's, it's also not always the most relevant distance function um, to pick. So if you're in a city and you're looking at the distance between point A and point B, um, yes, you can consider the, just the straight line distance, the Euclidean distance. But if you're actually navigating between point A to get to point B, it might make far more sense to consider the path length of the, of the, of the roads that you would have to take to get from A to B. Um, and in such sense, like, it's not actually a useful distance measure for your kind of behavior to, to to take the straight line from A to B. It's better to follow the city block distance. Um, and I think the, kind of the, the insight we had is that this also tr holds true in synaptic space. Um, so if we think about changes to synaptic weights, we can ask how should we actually measure the magnitude of this change? I think we often take the assumption that it's just the numerical distance between the EPSP size is the synaptic um, distance. But this isn't um, necessarily the only distance function we can use for synaptic weights. Um, and what I mean by this is if we just have a very simplistic example of considering two synaptic weights, so we have synaptic weight one on the x-axis and synaptic weight two on the, on the y-axis, and we consider from starting at this kind of configuration of these two synaptic weights, we can consider two changes. Um, and if you, if you take a Euclidean distance, you're going to say that the change moving to the left, left here, like delta W prime, is a, is a closer, is this, these synaptic weights here is, are closer than these synaptic weights. Um, but if we think about what we know about biology, um, changing the sign of a synaptic weight from a positive weight to a negative weight is basically impossible. Um, and it might make far more sense to consider an alternative distance function where we consider biological constraints um, kind of when we think about what, what synaptic weights are close or far from each other. Um, and by doing this, this, will inter like this determines the synaptic geometry. Right? It determines which configurations are close to each other and which are further away from each other. Um, and the point is that this isn't actually a, a, a trivial notion in the sense that if you're thinking about optimizing a neural network, optimizing a system, the geometry you choose for your parameters affects both the updates you make and the solutions you find. So here, this is, and this, this was pointed out before in 2020, but here we're considering two parameters, A and B, which are parameterizing a neuron's, a model of a neuron's activation function. Um, and they're, they're showing that if you, if you use a Euclidean distance or Euclidean geometry for A and B, or a Fisher information geometry for A and B, and then you look at the parameter space and you look at learning at different points in parameter space, you'll make different updates at different places, and you'll also converge to different solutions for your parameters. 
Um, and what this means in, in terms of synaptic weights is you'll actually also converge to different weight distributions. Um, and so in some ways, what we, had, what, we, what we worked on was the idea that the weight distribution itself gives you an understanding of what the geometry of the system might be. So like, at a very high level, um, what we're saying here is that you can, you can understand the geometry of the synapses by looking at the synaptic weight distribution itself. And one thing that we know in the brain across species and regions um, is that essentially synapses always follow a log normal like synaptic weight distribution. So what I mean by this is, for th is that if you record from a cell and, and like interrogate the strength of the connection between its, to its neighbors, so here say you're recording from cell one and looking at the connection strength to cell three, and you, and you look at the size of the EPSP um, between these two neurons, uh, and you do this for many different cells, you can end up with a distribution of synaptic weights, um, and it's, it's been found essentially always to be log normal. So if you, if, you, if you plot the EPSP size on the x-axis and log transform it, our log normal weight distribution appears as a normal distribution in space. So the idea here is that all weights tend to follow a log normal weight distribution. Um, and the work that we've recently put online, um, uh, sorry, it was Pogodin et al, 2023, um, is that essentially if you use the two norm or the Euclidean distance, you would expect your synaptic weights to be Gaussian, uh, which is not what you see in the brain. And so instead we were looking for, instead we looked and found a candidate distance function based on negative entropy. This is just the formula uh, here. There's no, there's no interpretation that we're using here, just the formula. You, you get a log normal weight distribution. So the idea here is that Essentially, we're just saying, look, there's two different functions for distance that we can use, and they result in different weight distributions. Um, and as you can see here, they will also result in different solutions being found by the system. Um, and so then, then the next question we had is, like, okay, so we're, we know that we find different weight solutions. But what does this actually mean for the computation of the system? Like, does it have any effect? And so there's actually a very basic and simplistic um, task where you can, you can show that by choosing your geometry, you have um, large effects on the computations learned by the system. So, and, and the, 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 the task we're showing here is one where you have some, some, some kind of task variables, but you are constructing the basic task such that only a few, in this case, K of these, of these task variables are relevant to the system. So um, in this way, we parameterized our task such that we can vary the number of irrelevant task variables. Um, so here we have, so if we increase um, like the number of task, task variables and keep K the number of relevant task variables fixed, we are, we are increasing the number of relevant variables. Um, and the point I wanted to make here is that if you're in the two norm or the Euclidean distance, as you increase the number of irrelevant task variables on the going left to right, um, your, the model fails to learn this task. Whereas if you're in this negative entropy geometry, um, the model always cons consistently learns the task, even with many irrelevant task variables. And so the point here is just trying to make is that by choosing your geometry, you, 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 you change the ability of the system to converge to different solutions. Um, and so that's basically like the, the summary here. So the synaptic geometry is a circuit level or a cell level measurement, i.e. I would say it's Sheratonian, um, and it, but it dictates the solutions the system will converge to. Um, and these solutions can have very different computational properties, which is a more of a kind of hot fieldian interpretation. And so understanding the synaptic geometry of a circuit could be a way to understand the computational um, cognitive properties. And so in some ways it sits in between the two, two, two views. Um, thanks for listening. I just want to point out this work is also done with Roman and Anna. And uh, thanks very much to Blake Richards for my supervisor. Um, yeah, so I guess the, I think this is, I guess, the getting to the heart of it in the sense that you could have 
multiple different weight solutions that have the same manifold, but you could also have, in, in the case that we showed there at the end where you fail to learn a task, you'd have different manifolds because obviously in one case you're failing to learn the task. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Um, so I will speak a little bit to um, time cells and ramping cells, um, to deep learning and reinforcement learning models, as well as to, and this goes against James' point a little bit, to how we should be cautious about understanding single neuron tuning curves. And I'm using, obviously, time cells as an example here. And so the ability to tell time is very important. It's everywhere. Understanding and generating speech, um, and this is Morse code, and also generating movement. Um, but how does the brain actually help us tell time? And so, in the past several decades, there's a plethora of neuroscientific studies that tries to understand this question. And one of the type of neurons that emerged was these ramping cell activities, which is that the activities of single neurons, they could monotonically ramp up or ramp down as a way of keeping track of time. And um, these neurons usually emerge in, like, for example, frontal cortex and striatum parietal cortex, and also if it's in the motor cortex or if it's relevant to um, generating movement, sometimes it has to surpass a um, certain threshold for the movement to um, actually come on. Um, so that was ramping cells. And then more recently, there's another type of cells that emerged, which are termed time cells. And so these are usually, um, people usually will um, train animals on some sort of working memory task. Um, during which there's going to be a delay period where the animal just kind of runs on the treadmill um, so that the location is fixed. And so sometimes you would see neurons, I'm showing two example neurons here, neurons that fire at a particular time during this period. Um, and if you um, pull all the neurons together, you can kind of see that they form the sequential activity that kind of tile the delay period. And they are named time cells because they are initially seen as these temporal analog of, of play cells, which are cells that fire at different locations. Um, and these cells also have been seen throughout the brain. They have been seen, I'm um, showing you here, like hippocampus CA1, um, orbital frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex CA3, uh, intrarenal cortex, and so on. And they've seen, as you can see, in pretty much any species. Um, but this kind of just motivated us to ask the question of, um, you know, how do these tuning curves actually contribute to behavior? I mean, first of all, do they really contribute to behavior? Um, and what are the neural mechanisms that underline um, these timing and sometimes, you know, the working memory um, mnemonic duration um, holding these stimulus um, in the brain? Like how? how do these representations achieve these, these cognitive functions? And so here we used, so we simulated um, this timing task that um, neuroscientists have been using to study the striatum, which is the delayed duration comparison. And so in this task, we um, first present the stimulus for a duration of T1, um, give it a little bit of delay period, and then we present the second stimulus for um, a duration of T2. And then after that, the um, reinforcement learning agent has to choose between, um, has to tell us which, which duration is longer to receive a reward. And so the reinforcement learning model that we used here is basically, oh, sorry, um, the current state or observation is passed through a recurrent neural network. In this case, we used LSTM. Um, and then it has to output a um, value function, which is how much reward the agent is estimating to receive from this current state, as well as a um, policy network, which is how I should act given this current state. And so the agent can learn to perform this task. And if you look at the activity um, of the LSTM or RNN network, um, during the stimulus presentation, which is the, pres which is the duration where you have to um, time, actually like keep track of time, you can see that there's these nice time cell looking or ramping cell looking cells that emerge in the RNN population. And also um, you can see that they um, keep track of the absolute time, meaning that if we change the 
the length of the duration, um, the preferred time of firing of these neurons, uh, of these units, I should say, of these units are still the same. Um, and also they differentiate between the two sensory stimuli um, as a way of sort of just um, working memory, um, keeping track of that. So that was, so the conclusion that we could draw from, from that was that time cells emerge with a timing demand in the task. But also, we did another task, which is just a working memory task, where the um, agent receives one of the two possible stimuli, um, experience a delay period during which it has to hold the stimulus um, in its brain or in its activity, and then after that, it has to make a choice um, that is non-matched to the stimulus. And so we use the same agent. Um, it can also be trained on this task. And if we record during the mnemonic delay period, so I, I just want to emphasize that there's no need to keep track of time during the delay period. Um, we can see that these time cells still emerge in the recurrent population and they still, one, encode time, two, encode the stimulus um, with its activity. So that was, I'm presenting a little puzzle here. I'm trying to present several pieces of evidence that suggest that we should sort of um, steer away from only focusing on the tuning curves, and this is one of them, which is that just because we're seeing a tuning curve doesn't necessarily mean that it's associated with the demand of um, the cognitive task. And then another piece of evidence that we're um, presenting here is that because we're using these artificial agent models, um, we can do in silico lesion, um, which is currently not something that is easy to achieve in real brains. And so how we did that was that you, know, you train a model on these tasks, and then after that, you identify which cells are time cells, which cells are ramping cells, um, based on the criteria that neuroscientists have been using to identify these cells. And then at each time step, you selectively lesion these cells. And then you pass them through the RNN, lesion the same cells, pass through the RNN, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we saw was that it doesn't really matter which type of cell or which type of unit um, you lesion. It only matters how many units you lesion. And so what I'm showing you here is that lesioning random units or lesioning ramping cells or lesioning time cells, they'll, they'll kind of give you the same thing. Um, and so we asked, is that just because we damage the recurrent dynamics of the network? And so to answer this question, we um, came up with the second type of lesion experiment, which is we call silence experiment. And so how we did this is that in a neural network that was trained on this task, we make a copy of this intact network. We make a copy of the activity of this intact neural network. And then at each time step, we silence these either time cells or ramping cells, and then we train the policy and, and value networks to read out from these silenced networks. And so basically the point is to keep the recurrent activity or like the non lesion unit activities the same, um, but only silence the ones that we identify as time cells. Um, and we saw that the um, performance was preserved to a very large extent if you just preserve the non lesion cells or you, if you just preserve the recurrent dynamics. Um, but still, it doesn't matter which type of cell you lesion, it only matters how many cell you lesion. Um, and I'll quickly go over um, just some of these um, further hypotheses that we're drawing here, which is that um, if time cells don't necessarily keep track of time per se, what do they really keep track of? And so the idea here is that they keep track of, of behavioral variables that unfold over time. And so here what we did is that we presented a non-mnemonic task where the animal doesn't, where the agent doesn't have to remember the identity of the, of the stimulus. Um, and so what we saw here is that if there's no working memory demand, these time cells don't keep track of the stimulus. And so how we can see that is um, um, we can have this analogy of, say, if your brain encodes two different stimuli with two different songs. And these songs, they unfold over time. Think of these songs as, think of the neural activities of the recurrent neural network as these songs. 
Um, and so if you look at um, these activities, they still change over time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the elapsed time is what they're encoding. They are really encoding the, the two sensory stimuli. Um, and if you see time cells this way as keeping track of behavioral variables that unfold over time, it also kind of explains why um, you know, time cells can also be ramping cells, uh, sorry, grid cells. This is um, an example from the MEC. Time cells could also be play cells, and this is an example from, I think, bad hippocampus. Um, and you can see there's a huge overlap between what's identified as play cells and what's identified as time cells. Um, and also, we also replicated this in our own study and showed that time cells are also play cells. Um, because location and distance and these kind of things sort of unfold over time, they change over time. Um, and so that's why the recurrent neural network um, would keep track of them, and that's why when you correlate them with time, you can see time cells. Um, but they don't necessarily um, keep track of time. And so in conclusion, what we're trying to say here is that there's a dissociation between encoding time and the actual timing behavior. And it's possible that time cells and ramping cells contribute to the timing behavior through the recurrent dynamics. Um, but instead, these neural activities might reflect the changes in neurodynamics and behavioral variables. Um, and we must be um, sort of cautionary when it, um, when it comes to understanding single neuron tuning curves. Um, and lastly, I just want to thank my co-authors, Anne and Blake, um, and also people who um, helped make this um, GAC workshop become a reality. You can see Johnny's here, Shahab, Dan, Arna, who unfortunately can't really be here today. Um, and thank all of you for turning this idea into a community. Um, with that being said, is it panel time? So I think now we'll have all the speakers come up and ask questions. Um, and if anyone has questions, we can start passing out the mics. Otherwise, um, I'll ask the first one. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yep. And so I think the thing that we would like to focus on during this panel is what, what would it actually look like to directly compare the two views? Is it something that can be directly compared or is it something that is just different ways that people can look at their data or, or use to explain, for example, their cognitive phenomena of interest? Um, or is it more comparison as to the abilities that the two views have? For example, as Tatiana pointed out, maybe the ability to make causal perturbations or causal predictions, which may or may not be in, the, uh, in one of the views or the other, so in the Sharontonian, but not the Hopfieldian. Um, and so if there are any questions from the audience, we'll start with that. Otherwise, um, can start with one of that. And so maybe I'll start with a question for Tatiana, actually, um, which is in all of the uh, circuit to manifold relationships that we have so far, it's usually a, a relatively simple manifold or a relatively simple task. And so I'm wondering if, if we want to use these as exemplars for, say, other ways of explaining more complex cognitive uh, complex cognitive phenomena for complex tasks, you see that as being something that is possible in practice or more something that we can kind of take inspiration from the simple circuits? Yeah, I guess um, when task becomes more and more complex, everything becomes more and more complex. Neural manifold will also become more complex. And if task requires 100 variables, then maybe it's the minimal dimensionality of the manifold at which you should be looking at. And I guess we struggle with interpretability already there. So I don't think like it's unique to circuit mechanisms that, that only circuits become less interpretable with the uh, expansion in size of system and its dimensionality. I guess everything just gets harder. So um, with the increase in size of the network, I think 
you'll, I mean, you, you have a lot more variance in your neural activity to fit into the various regressors. And I think part of a lot of the mixed selectivity findings have to do with not landing on the right set of internal or latent variables to describe what's going on. Um, and so to strike a note of optimism in favor of Sherringtonian networks, it could be that if we had better models of the cognitive operations that lead from sensory input or stimulus input to motor output, we might have a better handle on what the selectivities of these neurons are. If you don't have the right set of variables, you might just be parceling out your variance to a set of task variables that are not the appropriate set of variables for running those regressions. So the case of complexity makes things much harder. On the one hand, um, you might, if you have a simpler model, um, you might, one, a simpler, fewer number of variables, but fewer external variables or fewer motor variables, you might actually have a more Sherringtonian output because you might have, end up with a more interpretable single unit kind of disruption. But on the other hand, that may not be forthcoming. Uh, and also to strike an, a, 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 um, a blow in favor of Hopfieldian approaches, it might be that having a manifold will make evident what the relevant dynamical structures are to come to a conclusion about what those internal variables are. That's one of the things that I found most striking about the example of temporal interval estimation, where they saw these very beautiful trajectories through neural space, which r raised certain questions um, that may not have been evident if they were just looking at sort of the diverse ordinary least squares regressions from all the different units that were in the population. So I think complexity is challenging, and regardless of which view you take, you're going to need to connect the activity in these larger populations and these more complex tasks with a sound model of how the task could be solved and to try to use that as a lever to come to some sort of explanation of the activities that are observed, whether that's Sherringtonian and looking at the individual neuron activation functions or whether or not, or whether that's Hopfieldian and looking at, at the dynamics and the manifolds. So um, something that I'm trying to um, figure out myself, also during the break in discussions with others, um, it might sound as if um, the two views are actually two different levels of understanding. So um, I'll, I'll give an example. In, again, um, given my field of research, most of my examples come from vision. So in, in deep machine vision models, deep neural networks, um, people have shown that, for example, in deeper layers of a network, you see these kind of disentangled, disentangled manifolds of object representations. Um, but um, through the works of people like Chris Ola and, and others, it has been shown that you can actually reconstruct circuits, uh, circuits of neurons and connectivities that would lead to those um, manifold representation of objects. So they could actually show that you can find a circuit that starts from the first layer and via connectivity all the way to the last layer for representing a car, a dog, or, or whatever. And then it has been shown that if you lesion one of these circuits, the manifold will be deformed and also the behavior of the, uh, the network will be damaged, right? So this to me seems like an intersection of the two views, showing that you could re um, give an explanation for object representation in both circuit level and, and manifold level. Is it contradicting with your dichotomy? Uh, no, so every manifold arises as a result of correlated covariation in the firing rate matrices, for example. There's, there, every manifold arises, in other words, from some features or properties of the connections in the neural population or features of other aspects of the biophysiological substrate because it's not just limited to firing rates. Um, having said that, the question is, are the descriptions you give of those features able to generalize? This is what's key here is, are you able to capture the different instances of the phenomenon under the same description? There's no question that a Hopfieldian description is a coarse graining. So it's a different level of description. The question is, should we ascribe the representational and computational properties 
to those individual unit acti activities and the connections between them? Or should we rather ascribe the representations and computations to the Hopkillian level transformations, the transformations at the level of the manifold? If you have a description of a, of a network, an explanation of a network that is perfectly good and generalizable at the level of the Sharingtonian circuit, that doesn't uh, mean that you're not going to get a manifold. There will always be some sort of manifold that arises just because of the way the math works out, right? The question is, where should we ascribe the representations in our explanation? Where should we ascribe the computations in our explanation? And so it's not contradictory in the case that you're describing. It sounds like the Sharingtonian properties are both computing and representing and giving rise to the manifold. And in that case, the manifold is an explanatory epiphenomenon. It's something that arises naturally as a result of the ways that manifold arise. There's a coarse graining of the population activity that will give you a manifold description. It just doesn't play an explanatory role. And, and I contend that perhaps in that case you get a Sharingtonian explanation, um, but I contend that for a range of cognitive um, uh, phenomena, you won't get that generalizability at the level of, of the, network, of the uh, matrix of connectivities or matrix of firing rates or whatever. Instead, it will be at the level of the manifold. I would like to uh, challenge that. I guess I feel like in the way you speak about it, you make a distinction when you talk about representations on the level of activity um, and home field in view, you allow distributed representations, right? You are not talking about one neuron representing one thing. You talk about the population has some rep distributed um, code for whatever the network represents. But when we talk about connectivity, somehow I feel you talk about near and to near and connections like because the view of circuit i represented is kind of extension of the circuit idea to distributed networks there could be distributed patterns of connectivity in the network which give rise to these distributed representations right so in this sense i feel like we should treat connectivity fairly and distinction between sharingtonian and hopefieldian is not distinction between manifolds versus structure and connectivity because there could be interpretable distributed structure in connectivity and lower rank connectivity is one of the examples of such structure. Yeah, but I feel like the low rank connectivity descriptions that you're going to provide are not going to be explanatory in the sense of being able to fill representational and computational roles. What they will be are second level explainers of the manifold and it's going to be the manifold properties that play the representational and computational roles. So I'm not denying the importance of understanding low rank structure, for example, in the connectivity matrix. The question is, how can we ascribe a representational and computational role to that low rank structure? That I don't see. The low rank structure will give rise to manifold, but the computations, the way that information is being transformed to give rise to the adaptive behavior is going to be at the level of the manifold. Right, so, and I guess, look, like circuit models are a good example. Circuit model is not just connectivity. To specify a circuit model, we need to specify connection structure and also dynamics of the units, which define jointly what dynamics will arise in the network as a whole. Right? So like I guess when we talk about like circuit mechanisms, we don't separate connectivity from unit dynamics. So yeah. I also kind of yeah, right. see like why we kind of try to separate them. Good, yeah. And so this came up in the dinner we had last night, right? So I don't, when you talk about a latent circuit, I'm not quite sure what that means. To me, that says if there isn't, if there aren't, an, if there is not an implementation of these idealized nodes and these idealized connections, you call it a latent circuit. For me, it seems like it's just an absent circuit or a falsified circuit. There's going to be a circuit description of the dynamics on the manifold, but that doesn't mean that it corresponds to physical parts of the system in any robust sense, like neurons with connections that are able to be described as the latent circuit describes them. So I'm not entirely sh comfortable with the latent circuit idea for that reason. I think a latent circuit is one that isn't in the system, it's, it's idealized, or it's really, it's a, it's a false description. And so because of that, I'm, I don't agree with the latent circuit description. I do agree, of course, with the dynamical description that the latent circuit's constructed to match. And I think, so the, I agree with the dynamics, but the dynamics are the dynamics on the manifold. Uh, so I think I have a kind of a question that's related to this. Um, in the sense that we all, we, you're talking always about a, a manifold, but there's actually infinite numbers of manifolds that you get depending on your dimensionality reduction technique. Um, to Tatiana's point, it seems to me that the circuit 
is more, more of a concrete explanation. And if you wanted to test um, or even have the right manifold, you'd have to drop to the level of the circuit itself. So it seems to me that the circuit is the first level, and then you have some candidate manifolds, and you don't know if your manifold is correct or generalizable. Um, and at least in my understanding of an explanation, you'd want to be able to kind of test it. And that's why you need a circuit-based view. Again, so the, the circuits, all circuits are going to give rise to manifolds. The manifolds don't exist independently of their substrate. Sure, I just guess I mean that you don't know, uh, you just have a candidate manifold that you've arrived at by doing a certain dimensionality reduction technique. And you could do different dimensionality reduction techniques and get different manifolds. Um, but your circuit is the circuit. And yeah. so if you wanted to actually kind of explain something, you have to be at the level of the circuit because the manifold is kind of arbitrary depending on the technique you've used. Yeah, well, the question is what are you explaining? In this case, you're explaining the presence of a particular manifold or are you explaining the representations and computations that give rise to the cognitive behavior. So that's, I'm focused on the cognitive explanatum. That's an important point. You have to keep fixed the explanatory target here, which is going to be, now you could in turn explain the manifold, and that's going to be an explanation that necessarily will appeal to underlying substrate. So that's one component of my response. The second component is that I, and this may, maybe is a little unusual, I don't think if your manifold only arises from a single dimensionality reduction technique, I don't see that as good evidence for the existence of the manifold. You still only have what is called a data model. But in order to have grounds, inferential, good inferential grounds for the existence of the manifold, you want methodological triangulation. So you want to be able to use different dimensionality reduction techniques and other types of analyses that will provide evidence that it's not merely a data model that you're uncovering. But what would you do if you use different techniques and found different answers? What's the next step? Sorry? What? Let's say you have your data, you use different dimensionality reduction techniques, and they give you different answers. Yeah, that's evidence against the manifold. I would All of them? All like... It depends on other kinds of ancillary assumptions, like are there reasons to prefer one dimensionality reduction technique versus another? But in the case where there's no reason to prefer one such method to another, for me, that's evidence that you have a data model, but you don't actually have evidence of some underlying regularity. So I can give example like from this particular work I presented today, right? We can use different dimensionality reduction techniques on the same neural response data from month and Cecilia task, right? So if you look for representations of pure task variables, pure motion, pure color, we find what month and Cecilia found that these representations are not suppressed when they're irrelevant. When we use our latent circuit approach, we find that when we project on our motion and color axis, these representations are suppressed because they should not drive output. So these are two different manifolds which have very different interpretation of what computation is happening or how computation is happening, which we find in the same neural response data. So in our case, we could use perturbations in recurrent neural networks and show that when we perturb along the motion and color axis derived by, from correlational approaches, they do not affect behavior. Right, so, but this kind of level of insight, I feel like it's coming from the idea of circuit models as a transformation like which happens through recurrent interactions to transform inputs to outputs. Right? So if we just had statistical approaches to find these different manifolds in the data which don't connect, so which, which not only, which only fit neural responses and don't explain how these neural responses generate behavior, like in a causal way, I guess we would have no way to arbitrate between different answers. Uh, I mean, causal tools are certainly one way to arbitrate between different competing manifolds, for example. The fact that different methods give rise to different manifolds suggests to me that you have conflicting evidence about whether or not the manifold is merely a data model or it's picking up on an actual regularity underlying the pattern of firing rates that you've observed. In addition, though, I don't find causal, the, the requirement to drop down to a causal level to be all that persuasive. In every case, you're going to need to drop down to a causal level to enact a, a kind of perturbation that doesn't controvert a higher level coarse grain description. So I will say that we're going to ask people to stay here for the keynote, and we're just going to put it on here. That way, we're not trying to pack everyone into one room. Um, and we have to turn that on in one minute. So, <laughs> um, unless someone has something they have to say very quickly, 
then I think we're good. No, I just want to thank everyone. I thought it was really great. This was a ton of fun, and I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion. Yeah, and, yeah, and please come up and talk to, talk to us during lunch. <laughs>